I would like to welcome you all to Yale Radiology Grand Rounds. As most of you know, in IR, we have the opportunity to have speakers for either IR Grand Rounds or Diagnostic Radiology Grand Rounds. And uh, since we're currently in the process of trying to rebuild our pediatric IR practice, I thought it would be a great opportunity to highlight both the importance of peds IR to a hospital system, as well as giving the widest audience possible to those who might have an interest in this uh, specific topic. So today I am truly honored to invite Professor Anne-Marie Cahill to present on some very interesting um, and exciting work on the role of interventional radiology in the management of pediatric patients who have renal vascular hypertension. And later, I hope if we do have some time, uh, to ask her specifically what is needed to really grow a top-level and thriving pediatric IR program. So Professor Cahill is currently Division Chief of Interventional Radiology at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, a role that she's actually had since 2006. From 2006 to 2019, she was also the Director of Image-Based Therapy for Vascular Anom Anomalies um, there, as well as uh, being an um, endowed chair in pediatric IR at, uh, at, at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She completed her um, graduate uh, medical school from the University College in Galway, Ireland, and completed her radiology training at the Mater, I'm not butchering this, <laughs> Mater Misericordia Hospital in Dublin, Ireland, uh, completed a pediatric radiology resident uh, uh, fellowship at, uh, at, um, at, the, at British Columbia's uh, Children's Hospital in Vancouver, which was then followed by a pediatric IR fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, which she then completed in 1999. And she uh, took her first faculty position at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, where she worked from 1999 to 2003, and then moved to Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, where she has been now for approximately 20 years. Um, this year, or I should say last year, she was uh, promoted to full professor um, at the University of Pennsylvania per uh, Perelman's School of Medicine. So uh, Professor Cahill is an international expert in the field of pediatric IR. More specifically, her area of focus includes vascular malformation therapy, endovascular therapy of renal, renal vascular hypertension, which he's going to be speaking about today, as well as venous thrombolysis. She has authored or co-authored well over 100 manuscripts, reviews, and book chapters on a variety of topics all related to pediatric IR and has lectured around the globe. She also serves in many important capacities. She was the chair of the Pediatric Standards Committee of the SIR. She was the clerk for the ACR's Committee on Pediatric Imaging Research for many years and is now the immediate past president of the Society of Pediatric Interventional Radiology. And uh, due to her extensive and significant contributions to the field, she was elected a fellow in both the Society of Interventional Radiology, as well as the Cardiovascular and Interventional Society of Europe, which is CIRSI. And then more recently in 2022, she was awarded uh, a distinguished fellowship, which really only three members of the society uh, received. So with that, I think we will, uh, I'll stop there and uh, give Professor Cahill the floor. Thank you. Thank you, David. I, I'm sorry, I'm hoarse. This of course only happens right before grand round, so apologies for this husky voice. Um, as I was hearing your accolade, I thought, I'm sure they're thinking on the floor, do she ever work? But I do, four days a week. Um, so I hope I wow you with some of these cases and really change your perspective on pediatric renovascular hypertension and how it's very different to adults and a very important beast to be able to manage. So with no further ado, I'll get rolling here. Okay, let's see. Is it shift? Is it arrow? What is it now? It might be the mouse. It may be. So my disclosures. And the objectives, you probably have already, um, I won't go on about them, but basically I'm going to be talking about pediatric renovascular hypertension and how we manage it. So pediatric hypertension is challenging, and we're, I'm just showing you here the number of nuances required to diagnose it between the age, the weight, the height, family history or not. It's a, it's a real challenge to call somebody hypertensive, and it varies with age and height and all of these things. We have a problem, and I'll show you examples of diagnosing it in time, because trying to get a toddler's blood pressure is an insane type of activity. 
cough size just being stable and not trashing around, getting a 24 hour study is impossible. And even awareness, it's just like stroke. Kids do get hypertension, toddlers do get hypertension, but it's not something that's very much known or accepted. So a lot of work to still do on that. And definitions and percentiles, we leave it to the nephrologists. They triage, we confirm the triage and they come to us. So one of the things I want to highlight here is I'm a member, a board member of the Pediatric FMD Society <clears throat> that has a research arm, which is the PCORI Collaborative. And it's led by Dawn Coleman, who is now the chair of surgery at Duke. She was in Michigan. And we meet every month and we discuss primary research potential, discuss imaging findings, surveys to highlight how we are going to increase awareness, how families can help us increase awareness. A lot of work's being done on this. And uh, so if you're interested, you are very welcome to join this collaborative on many different levels. So just to highlight that. Um, we also have a hypertension program at CHOP, and that is also something that highlights hypertension in children, just like stroke, which is an uncommon thing. And one of the things CHOP is known for, I will say I'm very proud of, is using the cutting balloon specifically for this disease entity, which is really not used that much around the world. So why is this so important? So for example, here we are with a kid who presents with a CT and acute flank pain, and he has no perfusion, and he's a teenager to this right kidney, and he has acute renal artery occlusion. And thankfully, we were able, and I'll show you the case, to recanalize this, but he had undiagnosed renal artery stenosis, but hypertension for several years. The second one is a three-year-old. By the time he comes to us, he already has significant right renal volume loss, he was not ever diagnosed with hypertension um, in the first three years. And the second one is a pay, third one is a patient here who is, was in the CICU on IV labetalol with uncontrolled hypertension, IV and PO in the ICU. So it is real. It is an entity that we need to be aware of and we need to be able to address. Why is this different? So, you know, this <clears throat> string of beans that little string of beads in women, maybe 30s, 40s, you pop it with the balloon, 90% 90, 90 or more success, gone, See you, never see you later. Kids get a different type of disease. It is intimal, I believe. Um, it is often long and smooth, or it can be very short, but it is intimal and it's very fibrotic. And it's uncommon. It's really 5 to 10% of adults, but it's almost all of what I say, well over 50% of CHOP. Now, can I tell you exactly that it's intimal? I can't because we're not putting these renal arteries in a bag. We're in them. We're not taking them out. So I don't have the imaging proof of it or the pathologic proof. But we do have some proof just from looking at these diseases in other entities. So this is a patient with NF, multiple renal arteries, all of them with stenosis, had bypass, had explanted some of these disease segments, and this is courtesy of Michigan. And you can see this dense intimal thickening here with fracture within it, sort of just fra micro fractures in the intima. Here, the intima and media is severely thickened, but intimal for sure. And that is really what we got to crack. So when we're, when we're plasting these, you need to take it to a different level because it is not a medial hyperplasia. The spectrum of disease in the old days, now it's CTA, of course, this has gone away, but you'll see complete coarks, you'll see multiple renal artery origins, you will see long, smooth stenosis, you will see it out to the arcuate level. And I'll show you these examples during the course of this talk. You will see it in accessory arteries. You gotta look for it in these places. You'll see, co you know, coincidentally, main and distal disease. Distal disease beyond which there's poor perfusion. You will see very focal narrowings if you're looking for them properly out in distal renal arteries. And you can see here this particular disease way out here in the subsegmental area. So the spectrum of disease is very wide. We published a paper back in 2011 that looked at 68 angiograms. And you can see here the spectrum of disease all the way to the parenchyma level. More than one stenosis in a significant number of them, multiple stenosis in a third, but one to two stenosis in 84, some associated aneurysms, some mid aortic syndrome, but greater than second order in 12%. And this is where the conventional diagnostic imaging will fall apart once you get to this second order, at least and beyond. 
And unfortunately, we use way too often, we use ultrasound as a screen for children. I mean, ultrasound is a good screen if it's a very obvious greater than 70% stenosis. Um, yes, but you have all of these issues, multiple renal arteries, overlapping arteries, accessories, like I showed you there, mental stenosis, multiple stenosis, and patient movement. So you have all these things. So it is not a good tool unless you get your classic parvus tardis. And this is a patient that I had, an, a renal artery stenosis. And you can see here, we're using a RADI wire, which is intra, an intravascular wire within the artery, which is pretty standard for us, it's wireless. And you can see the difference. You can see that there is a drop off when you put it in the renal artery compared to the normal. And that reflects what you'd expect with ultrasound, but it must be about 70% or higher. Otherwise, you're not going to have that sensitivity with ultrasound. And it should not be in the tool of in total, total exclusion. It should be one of your, on your pathway to exclusion. We published this recently, and this is what I really want to have body imagers aware of. We blinded two people, more senior and more junior, with CTs without the angio. And then the angio was revealed to them later in patients we knew had stenosis. And this is recently published. And blinded, we had only a 14% pickup at the second, which is at the hilum and beyond, and third order um, level which means in you saw the number that have two stenoses and go beyond the main renal was over 80% in our series. CTA is not going to pick up the second or third order in many of your institutions. And these were pretty experienced people. And partly because they're a dotogram, we try to keep the dose as low as we can and compete with the ACR registry and everything looks beaded. And so everybody says all the beading is normal because it's all beaded everywhere. And you can see a classic example of, you know, how beaded everything looks here. That's not all abnormal, but the dose is so pixelated. So be mindful that you can only exclude a certain amount and you certainly can't even see this artery here that's narrowed on this reconstruction. But you can see there is some abnormalities here, but obviously angio is the gold standard. So what we do now is if you have the right weight, the right height, the right, no family history, you have all the things that should give you a normal blood pressure and you're abnormal, we do a diagnostic angio and we prepare for intervention because I'm not going to just bring them back another day. We'll move on to the intervention if something is found, but it is not excluded on just CTA if there is enough evidence that there should be something. If you're on two medications, normal weight, no family history, et cetera, maybe one at a high dose. That's the, where the jury is out, is one, maybe, maybe not. One for us, we do do, but a lot of centers do not. Where is surgery? We have a very good relationship with our vascular surgeons, and we've now a dedicated one, 40% to CHOP. We didn't believe it or not have before. They just came as we needed them. And there are roles for it. There are roles for surgery when you have large renal artery aneurysms that really need to be taken out. Um, you have a role when you have a tight cohort. This is a patient that had a bypass because they had claudication and poor renal artery perfusion. And, you know, in cases like this, Derek Roebuck, a good colleague friend of mine, was doing some aortic angioplasty, needing sheets from both femoral vein, femoral arteries, from both auxiliary arteries and every single branch protected with a wire to temporize to an older patient. They have been the only ones doing it. To be honest, I have not been embarking on any or aortic angioplasty and with mixed results. Some of the branches had to be stented and we don't want to be stenting patients that are very young in any setting, hopefully. So again, small series, but the only series that I'm aware of that's done any aortic angioplasty and we have not been. Now, am I going backwards and not forwards here? I am. The other thing that you have to think about here is if you have FMD of the renals, have you anything going on in the head? And this is a patient that hyper had hypertension for a long time and that was not diagnosed with tachyasis, but had some cognitive decline in a high school and was just flipping grades and all of that sort of thing. Um, no obvious extremity issues that, that were diagnosed at least. But you can see here the extreme reduction, I mean, the branch narrowings that you have off the aorta aortic arch and the collateralization that you get from the thankfully the circle of willis kicks in and so what what we do when somebody has um, a known fmd is we do do an mri of the brain 
MRA, MRI, just to make sure that we're not missing something. Because if you drop the blood pressure and you're missing something, then you can create some more, you know, worsening ischemia. Have I much evidence? It's less than 10% of those patients, except for NF, have intracranial findings. But it's something, this patient particularly, who was undiagnosed even with Takayasu's highlights, the need to at least screen and create the data for the incidence of brain versus peripheral FMD. So we're building the data. The angiographic technique, I, tell, I teach the residents and fellows, you need anesthesia. I mean, I always say the angio needs to look like the patient's dead. I mean, you suspend respiration, you confirm it's suspended. You want a very, very nice picture of the kidneys. So you want a breath hold. You want them under anesthesia. And then you want it to look like that so you can see every little branch and make sure nothing is getting bigger as it goes more peripherally. And you want to see every little, make sure that you angle and open out everything. You want to inject with three French catheters, the accessories in the same way. So we do all of that. We do glucagon for bowel peristalsis. We brought the grid in for detail. We want to have dose. I mean, dose is important because this is a graduating angiogram. If this is normal, you're done. You're not going to see me again. This is the last time you'll have an angio probably. And you need to do multiple views. I don't do the rotational angio because it doesn't, I feel, give you enough length into the venous phase and you don't see the cortex as well because it's a very quick fire. So yes, you'll see branches, but you won't see out to the cortical level very clearly. And the reconstructions then you're back to CT. So we just do a bunch of runs. What I like to use, and it has evolved a little over time, and I, I don't want to quote proprietors or companies, but this is my go-to, the flexor sheath. Um, and it is a cooked product because I like the shape of this. And it's a five French I normally use, but it sits very nicely and can angle into most renal arteries. Um, our Sterling balloon platform is what we use. It's a peripheral vascular balloon platform and it's monorail. And they go from 1.5 to 6 millimeters. Hence, we can get quite far out in the kidney to do peripheral angioplasty with a 1.5 balloon. It's two centimeters, but it is 1.5. A lot of the time, if you're going from the leg, you're going to need something like a four French sauce omni just to get in to some of these more vertical arteries if you choose to go from the leg. And then because these are 014 platforms, you can use the 014 balloon for your conventional angioplasty and the cutting balloon. The Wolverine is 014. So we operate over an 014. This we really love, and I think it's changed the game. This is the Raddy wire. It's a wireless 014 pressure wire. And we use that when we're in the main renals. It's hard to measure pressures when you get out to the segmental area, but you can work over this wire. You can measure pressures in the aorta. And as you're going into the renal, you'll see the pressure difference. Um, obviously, you don't want to wedge the catheter in the origin of the renal or you will get a false drop in pressure. So you want to do it as you're going in and before you fully advance the catheter in. But it's, it really helps. And it's a beautiful thing to see the pressure gradient go from 20 down to one or two at the end of your case. It's uh, very rewarding. I'm not going to go on too much about this, but <clears throat> we do keep patients on aspirin if they're on it because they have moya moya in their brain. We do continue it. We, we don't stop it, but we will decrease our heparin dose. But we leave them on it. We want to protect the brain. We don't change it. I usually use the loading dose when I find a stenosis, when I cross it of 75 per kilo and keep the ACT double whatever their starting ACT is. And it's a very rough guide. Hematologists hate the ACT, but it's the best we've got in the room. Anti-10A levels take 30 minutes to come back. You'll be waiting way too long. And then we use nitroglycerin if you get spasm because, and that's the key. You need a very good aortogram because once you enter a renal artery, it can spasm. And then your source of truth is back to the aortogram and say, aha, that was normal on the aortogram, this is spasm. Otherwise, you get yourself all messed up with what is now stenosis and what is not. So you need to have a pristine aortogram to work off and then compare. Very, very important. Renal artery stenting, I have never had to do it and hopefully never would. If, if I had to, it would be a cutting balloon complication that required a covered stent. We are not doing balloon expandable stents in kids. And this is an example here of a kid that came from DC, having had a trauma to her right, her left kidney that required stenting. It was a, an extravasation. And she had that in August. In January, she comes to me with a atrophic kidney and severe hypertension. And you can see here, we also use the 
the um, if IVUS, the four French IVUS, you can see the instant stenosis, which I plastied and it's much improved, but that was in six months. And now they've sent images of her since. And of course her kidney is not, is, is back, not growing and in stent stenosis again. So in specimens that are four or five millimeters, stents are terrible. I think they were terrible in the coral trial in adults too, but they are terrible. They're to be avoided. It looks good for a hot minute and then they're stenotic again. So it should not use stents for renal artery stenosis in children. Um, one day I'm hoping that we'll have bioabsorbable stents. That would be golden, but that is not possible right now. Um, I have these for humanitarian use available should there be a catastrophic event and we need something in the se sense of a covered stent to save a kid's life, but that would be it. That would be the reason because they can actually go down to as low as two to three millimeters. The gore is higher. So we need something that in the papyrus can get low enough to do something good in a younger kid's renal artery, at least for the time of the rupture. Um, and then of course we have a Viabon or there are lots of things you can use at five millimeters, but we're not using them and I have not had to use it thankfully. Sometimes I have to use auxiliary artery axis and I've become much more interested in that lately than I used to because even if you use the sosomni and hook into a very vertical artery, it is a bear to get the cutting balloon around that bend over an 0 and 4 wire. It's just inefficient. It is just a terrible experience often. So we usually use electively the left auxiliary artery because in kids, the brachial and the radial arteries are much smaller. The good thing about the auxiliary artery is you can press like the femoral on the humeral head and get good control. And it's bigger like the femoral artery. So, and to back that up, my friend, Derek, um, published 19 children with an auxiliary artery axis as low as 2.6 kilos with no complications. I mean, that maybe jury is out, but no arm loss at least. Um, so I've gone to that almost exclusively when it's a very vertical artery like this one to operate from the auxiliary artery. We can maybe in older patients consider going from the radial, sure. I'm just very comfortable with the auxiliary artery now and you can see some beautiful results here um, using that technique. I will say you need the pressure wire and other things I'm gonna show you to decide that you're done because you have post stenotic dilation. So what you don't and won't expect is that this artery will be the same size as what's distal you're going to match it to parameters like your pressures, okay? You're not going to be able to make that as big as post stenotic dilation, and it shouldn't be, because that is not the normal size of an artery at that age. So you're not going to see this gorgeous linear artery that's equal to your post stenotic dilation, and don't expect that. CO2 angiography, in fact, Jim Caridi, who unfortunately passed away, a very nice man, was really very big in this world. And it is something that we are doing. And I'm using the CO2 commander because it feels a lot better than using those big cylinders that you have to believe have CO2 in them and not air or some other thing. They come and you know it's CO2, which was always my concern. And so there are sometimes cases where you've an elevated creatinine, a single kidney and a renal artery stenosis, just like we have here. And in that sort of case, you are forced to reduce your contrast and work over less than ideal circumstances, but it does work. It does work. And this is the kind of thing you have with 10 cc's of contrast and knowing your roadmap is CO2, you can get a lot of work done knowing that you've got the stenosis and you just keep going. And then you can see such a, and this patient was on three medications and Kate went off all medications because they had a single tight stenosis of their main renal artery in their single kidney. A real, a real cluster, but got it done and the patient's off medication. The pressure gradient had been 50. We brought it to two. Pretty significant pressure gradient. So don't forget CO2 when you need it. So the good F F FMD, we have the good, the bad, and the ugly. We have published, so has Dr. Roebuck, so has some of the Chinese studies, a short segment stenosis is your best responder. And that makes sense. A long, narrow stenosis is extremely difficult to dilate in homogeneously. So <clears throat> this is a patient that was on two medications. He was five years of age. Very difficult to get through that. You can see that it's, it's, it's almost occluded. 
We did dilated it up and you have a non-flow limiting dissection. He was kept on heparin overnight, transitioned to aspirin and he's off medication. So one of the things that can happen with these is they're really tight. And so when you dilate them, I mean, you rip the wall essentially. So you have to be able to identify this, mitigate issues. They're going to be in house, make sure that the artery is open the next day with contrast ultrasound or Doppler ultrasound, et cetera. We're very successful. I like to see them being short. And you see the kidney is much smaller. Look at the size of that kidney. And this proves another point because kidneys will grow in kids even as teenagers. So you have two reasons to dilate them. One is to get them off meds or reduce their meds. The second is for the kidney to grow, right? Or not occlude suddenly and have to be recanalizing it. And they will grow. They have grown and it's part of this new paper we're publishing hopefully soon, the interval growth post-angioplasty. This is why you need a very good angiogram. Look at this one. That's the stenosis. Now you're going to be looking at these and overcalling them after my visit for years to come. <laughs> so, and so this, you can go out there with an 0-4 wire that was not seen on CT, but you can see this artery is bigger than everything around it. So you ask yourself why, and there it is. And then you can go out with a two millimeter balloon and you can see that the perfusion of that portion of the kidney is even better because it's also hyperperfused compared to the rest of the cortex, which is another indication on CT and on angio to be looking for ancillary types of findings to get that subtle sort of stenosis. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to go forward here with this. This is one where the patient had a, a very hyperperfusing kidney, was on two medications. I came from the left axillary artery down, pressure gradient was over 30. And you can see using the cutting balloon in this case, pre and post angioplasty, a very beautiful result. And this highlights here, and I'll show you this in contrast ultrasound. This is one picture in time, but you can see how poorly the cortex is perfusing. And the same picture in time, now suddenly because of the beautiful flow, you're getting better cortical enhancement. It took several frames to get the right picture on the left. It's slow. So you, the angio gives you very dynamic information. And sometimes when you have a stenosis, you don't see all of the kidney because that stenosis is directed into a branch. And so it takes out not just that area, but takes out distal renal parenchyma. And so this is a very tight stenosis here. And after angioplasty, there you go. Look at all this other kidney you can see now that you could not see before the stenosis was dilated. So this proximal stenosis kind of downstream effects because right there was another bifurcation that had been severely stenosed across being fed from this main renal. So, you know, it, I can't say how beautiful it feels when you see these pre and post images. It's, it's really, at the end of a case, it's very rewarding. Now we can get further out here. And so when I'm talking segmental, I'm talking, you know, beyond the first order, even the second order. And so this here wasn't called, but in retrospect, there's something too fat, too wide here on this lower pole left renal. I mean, it's not the greatest reconstruction. It, hard to say, but in retrospect, there was something bigger than its neighbors on that CTA. Here you can see, and this is a little off center, but there's something not quite right about this left lower pole here. And then when you do it selective, you can see there's a very tight narrowing of that branch heading down with post stenotic dilation, which is why it's bigger than its neighbors. We used a two millimeter cutting, um, non-cutting balloon here, a stir at 1.5, I'm sorry, sterling. There's no, the smallest cutting balloon is two. And this patient came off, six-year-old came off medications. It was the only area of stenosis in this case. Sorry, backwards. Sometimes, and this is a patient that was in the ICU with a diastolic of 110. And on IV and PO medication, I remember well, she came from um, Nepal actually. And we play the CT and you can appreciate that the CT really can't appreciate anything. It's fair. It's completely fair. So we end up doing a diagnostic angio and she has two stenoses and poor visualization of this portion of the kidney. Two, not just one. And you can see the post stenotic dilation in both of these areas. Again, that's always the kind of thing we're looking for. And we put in two 014 wires through our sheet. 
and we can sequentially then advance our three and two millimeter catheter angioplasty balloons over that. And afterwards, you're going to see spasm. You can give some nitroglycerin, all of that sort of thing, whatever you need. But what you're looking for is ref relevantly or preferentially that you have flow and relatively it's the size you'd expect that um, artery to be. Being spasmed, et cetera, from beating it up with two wires and that kind of thing. And this patient went home on one medication and out of the ICU. So again, a good save, very good save. But again, it's not necessarily a pretty picture. If the nitroglycerin doesn't work, this is what you're left with. You can measure your pressures across these areas, make sure they're the same which they were. And that's kind of all the ancillary information you need to pull out and just be done before something bad happens. This is one that just came in recently, a four-year-old with hypertension. Again, not visible on CT. And you can see the very subtle narrowing here on this branch. And poor, perf well, you can't really say poor perfusion in this stage. I won't say that to you, but there was poor perfusion to this middle area here. We used a three millimeter mini ghost. Now, this is another thing. These are peripheral vascular balloons. The mini ghost, we, I learned from the interventional cardiologist at Hop, is something that they use quite a bit in, in the coronaries. It is a one centimeter balloon. So that is my go to balloon with the dot in the middle for short segment stenosis, because you're not doing a two centimeter angioplasty of a two millimeter stricture. The smallest you have is a one centimeter balloon on any market. So we use the cutting balloon. The minute ghost, it's a semi-compliant balloon with a burst pressure of about 12, 14. And um, sometimes it will do the job. In this case, it did the job. It is uncommon, but I think you can appreciate how beautiful that response was. So it's hard to predict. That is why I use a conventional balloon first before you would consider a cutting balloon. And I'm, you know, that was that was a beautiful result, and the patient came off medication. Sometimes they're very far out and the CT again, negative on this case. But when you're looking for angiographic findings, you're looking, and this was one example here where the cortex wasn't quite enhancing the way you'd like it to. So then you start to look closer and you go, why? I wonder why that is. And there you see a stenosis very out there in the arcuate artery in the same distribution as that area of hypoperfusion. And in that area, we can get a 1.5 millimeter peripheral vascular balloon over an 014 wire. And look, really nice result. Now you have perfusion in the cortex. You see the channel there that's open. And this patient, again, look at their blood pressures before we began. And this is another thing <clears throat> we're learning over the years. You could have one single stenosis in this vessel way out in the kidney and have a whopping blood pressure and you can have a tight right main renal stenosis and be on maybe just lisinopril but your problem there is also the kidneys not growing you're not on three meds but you have a tight stenosis we don't know why a small stenosis creates crazy blood pressure and a main renal artery one can be a tolerable blood pressure still to be discovered but it's a fascinating disease from that point of view then sometimes we have things that we can't do a lot about, and that is parenchymal disease. And this is a patient, and this actually here, that is has deep disease, and I'd love to ethanol ablate it, but in ethanol ablating it, I'm going to take out quite a bit of normal artery. So if we can, we try and limp along with ACE inhibitors and ACE blockers, because what can happen, some of these disease processes, is that the kidney will auto-infarct that area, being chronically on these ARBs and ACE inhibitors. Or you're then forced to try and take out, hopefully, as selective a renal artery distribution as you can, but it's very difficult. Sometimes we have to balloon and wire disrupt. In this case, the wire only went, and you kind of disrupt it. And this was a vascular surgeon's kid, actually. Of course, he had a, an angio, um, a stenosis that you couldn't get a balloon across, even a 1.5. And then you end up with sort of a sort of, you know, you have this sort of ill-defined stenosis here that we balloon disrupt. We try and get out, but it's actually a little further out than that. And then you're kind of left with an avascular area. In fact, this particular patient came off medication. He may go back on it in a year. For now, they're very happy. He came off medication and the vascular surgeons love us. And 
we do what we do. It's a bit like the lymphatics when you're disrupting the thoracic duct leak. It's a little bit like that. But in this particular patient, she was on three meds, an eight-year-old, and all she had were these findings here. Some collaterals to the capsule. Very interesting. That's all I could find. She continued to need additional doses of three medications. And so we decided we'd do it. Ethanol ablate that very distal area down here, these two branches. And we did with 0.1 mLs through a really low flow 1.9 microcatheter. And obviously you have to measure the volume of the catheter and not flush it in to check for an angio, you need to pull it. And this is how she looked at the end. And I thought it was a Hail Mary. She also has reduced perfusion there and it would never work. Well, she's off medication, which is amazing. I mean, I would not have expected that. So sometimes you just have to give something a go, particularly if someone's on three meds and all the doses are only going up. So ethanol ablation is something that we need to consider when it's a suitable patient. We have seen some very deep disease. This patient had no history of, hyper of uh, pyelonephritis. Sometimes it can be at the microvascular level. So you do an angio, you look, everything looks beautiful. And then you go to the other kidney and you just don't have good perfusion distally in any of the branches. We don't know why this happened. We can't say very much to her about what we can do nothing about it right now. Um, but it can be as deep as arcuate and beyond. And this is a good example here of us not quite sure from a CT or an ultrasound imaging point of view and needing to do an angio. And it's the only case I have of this, but that's about as deep as you can get. In terms of accessories, <clears throat> we're looking at this in our literature right now too. There is some, I will say, predisposition to having hypertension and accessory renals. And I don't, we don't know why. Several of the patients that had no renal artery stenosis in our series had accessories. You measure the gradient in them, it's the same. I don't know whether the aorta and the accessory versus the main renal sees different flow. It's very different. The group in Atlanta did decide to use PVA and coils and accessories and presented that at one of our SIR sessions at one point with, as you can imagine, little success because now you're creating more ischemia in the same area. But they were also feeling like I, that accessories predisposing you to hypertension. In saying that, embolizing them is not the solution. But occasionally, even though you have an accessory that appears normal, you may have an accessory that does not appear normal. And this is an accessory artery, which is why the orthogram is so important because you'll pick up the accessories that had a very tight stenosis on a bifurcation. And I was not able to get two wires across, so I got one and I used a two millimeter balloon. And you can see that I, I, I did notice sort of density in the retroperitoneal area. And you can, and which was extravasation. And it's not like the accessory artery is filleting in the wind in the retroperitoneum and the patient's exsanguinating. It's that there's a hole in the artery that you have now identified. And so what you do is you put up, if it's a cutting balloon, you don't use that again. And I have one of those examples. You use a conventional balloon, which was the two millimeter, leave it up for about 10 minutes. I did not reverse the heparin because I don't want to clot the artery. And then you turn it into a contained dissection. And of course, the patient's staying that night. You keep them on heparin. Um, obviously, they're in the ICU. We have everybody recover from angioplasty in the ICU. And you do a Doppler the next day, and then they go home on aspirin. So this patient had a rupture that became a contained dissection, went home um, on aspirin, and is now off medications. Okay, so you will still need to keep them on heparin if you can, but you need to manage that acute event with balloon insufflation for about 10 minutes. The cutting balloon experience that I first wrote with back in 2007, but had preceded, started doing a little bit of this work in 2005, was on a four-year-old with this blood pressure and extremely resistant stenosis. And this is what we see. You know there's another thing you can't just crack, and it just eats away at you, and you just know you've got to do something else. And then when you take out that balloon, it doesn't look any better. So you haven't done the kid any justice. This is what the cutting balloon looks like with two little dots on it, but it's much bulkier. So if you don't, if you have a very tight stenosis, it's hard to get it across a very, very tight stenosis, particularly if it's a steep angle, which is, as I said, why I use the auxiliary artery. It's got blades. If you take it out of the patient after deploying it, you will, you will basically get a laceration of your finger if you touch it. They are blades. 
when it's deployed and inflated, the blades are three sets of blades. Usually I will do it once, then twist it. I don't think it twists, but try it. You're supposed to twist it and score two more another time, but I don't think it moves in small arteries. But basically they are blades. So you have to be very careful taking it out and take it out through the sheath, which is placed in the artery origin. You don't want to be taking it out and, and shish kebabbing a lot of other arteries on your way out. You need to secure it in the sheath as soon as you can. And this patient is still off medication. He is in our series that we'll be sending to JVI or very soon. He is one of our oldest patients in my practice. And I called him and he's finished college and his blood pressure is normal and he's not on meds. And it's a wonderful thing when you can track them down and they're living their lives off medication. NF is really a bear. So in NF, you have multiple renal artery stenosis, all of which I staged renal artery cutting balloon. And it can look miserable. I mean, it looks all broke, chopped up. The wall is beaten up because you're creating a blade um, tear in the wall, but you have an improved lumen. This kind of patient, their medications may go from three to two, three to one, but they're not going to be cured because they have a process, a systemic disease. They're going to have multiple stenosis. You're going to be redoing them. Their recurrence rate is higher, but the idea is you take them off the most offending medication, the one that bothers them the most with side effects, or you know, you, at least you reduce the number of medications. Often it's the side effect one, a clonopine, a calcium channel blocker that parents just want their kid off because of headaches and you know, postural hypotension and that sort of thing. But it will look sometimes like this image on the right afterwards, no question. And this patient was undiagnosed and as I said, came to us with acute flank pain from the ER, came to body imaging and they consulted me and thankfully they, they saw that this kidney was not perfusing, they should. And we used the reverse curve catheter here and got in. I can't even believe we got in, but we did get in with an 014 wire and a four fringe swasomni. We did TPA, we did penumbra, we gave IV heparin. Then we found that the stenosis was a tight stenosis at the origin. And even if you look here, even if you don't see something that's that obvious, if the balloon does not fully conform and fully expand, you have not gotten the job done, which is really a tricky thing. This never fully expanded. And so then you can see here, after using the cutting balloon, we have a contained dissection, we have a kidney, and at the very end, we have a lumen. We got that kidney back, but it was quite a lot of work. He had never been diagnosed with hypertension, and his kidney had not grown, and he had such a tight stenosis, he presented with acute renal occlusion. So it can be devastating if it's not diagnosed. So our experience is a little bigger now than what I wrote here, because we're finalizing our results. And even though this is not 150 or 500 Chinese angioplasties, I just reviewed a paper and I thought, oh my God, um, it is a lot for any center. Um, and we have a little more than that, and 85 lesions. And it's ramped up. In earlier career, you might get two, three, four a year. Now, we probably one a month. So this isn't reflective of 20 years of sustained volume. The volume has climbed. But what I want to show you, and it's very much the same in the Roebuck Great Ormond Street, you have about an 80% response. I would challenge that it's about 60% cure in the main renals in our series now with the additional patients we've added and improvement in 40. And the ones that have not been cured are syndromic, not just isolated renal artery stenosis. Um, <clears throat> these are the patients we salvaged with a cutting balloon. And, and it's more now, 25 lesions that would not have been treated had we not used the cutting balloon. And again, a cure in 30% of those that would have walked away without a response and an improvement in 55. So this is, I think, this will be an, an isolated, pardon the pun, cutting balloon paper and then a full series because I think it'll be a real landmark paper for just the use of cutting balloons. So watch out for that in JVIR. And if you look here at Roebuck, they're almost the same, you know, an improvement in 63, cures in 23, main renal, higher rates. And again, he said like our old paper in 20, we did, we wrote a renal angioplasty paper in 2011, less than one centimeter stenosis is the best. So we're very much aligned. And he had 78 children there with multiple repeated procedures. Um, they're not doing the same volume now. He's in Australia, but um, yeah, he was really leading this field um, before he left. Complications, I'm going to show you some because it isn't without its um, complication rate and it is not for the, I have no 
colleagues chomping at the bit to do cutting balloon angioplasty right now. I do need some, but none at the moment. Um, and so <clears throat> don't panic. I would tell you don't panic. So this is a patient with a very tight left renal artery stenosis and a moderate right. And eight-year-old with a mid-aortic syndrome. So he's eight. And so, you know, you'd have a multidisciplinary conference, which we have once a month with our vascular surgeons. And they say, can you do angioplasty and get them a little older? Maybe we'll do a bypass to them, you know, when they're 12, but not, not so far. And they have no claudication. They have no mesenteric issues. So can you temporize them? And that's usually our discussion. So in this case, this is what you see. You know, you see this thing that just does not pop. And you know now you have to use the cutting balloon. And usually what I do is downsize the cutting balloon one millimeter. So I'm, I'm targeting the artery to be four or five. I'm going to use a three cutting and then go back up to a four or five. So I used a three cutting and we have effacement that, that opened out completely. And then I went back up to the four um, and five balloon and I saw this. Okay, you tell the anesthesiologist we have some artery trauma coolly and calmly, you leave your wire there, you take out your cutting, the, the, you take out the, the cutting balloons out, you put back up a four, I didn't put up a five, I left it up 10 minutes, and you repeat the angiogram and look. It's a beautiful result. But it does take a little, you have to pause. This, as I said, the, this renal artery is not flying in the breeze in the retroperitoneum. It's got a hole in it and it looks terrible. You just put up your balloon, leave the heparin on board and you will be just fine. And it is really amazing because also what you see compared to the angiogram pre is more arteries. You see this angiogram pre, you're missing a whole bunch of arteries here and I'm injecting from the origin. Look, that stenosis was rather tight and enough to decrease perfusion to that kidney. Although you can see a decent kidney here on the orthogram, but small, it's a small kidney because that's a very significant stenosis, okay? So that is a renal artery extravasation. I have had one renal artery pseudoaneurysm and it was a very tight stenosis that required the cutting balloon on a branch that came back with this noted on ultrasound, which was fantastic. They're one month ultrasound and we did an angiogram and you can see it's, it's a bit of a bear. And there is some hypoperfusion of that left upper kidney. So we treated this like you would treat a brain aneurysm and used target microcoils and had wire protection and distal embolic protection. And then, you know, continued to do this as best we can and secure both lobes of this like you're doing a brain aneurysm. And this patient is on, you know, two, one med, not two at this point, but we salvaged that pseudoaneurysm. So you do have to be able to respond to some rare, but, but you know, understandable complications. And you can see that very nicely on IVUS, which we use the four French IVUS, which has the chromophobes, you can see color. So that pseudoaneurysm was well, we could document that prior to coiling. And then you can see afterwards the coiling, it's coiled. And we also use the IVUS for vessel sizing, which is very handy also at times. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite a nice instrument. That and the RADI wire, I would say are very useful for this kind of intervention. We do follow-up ultrasounds. We do them first on the day of uh, on the day of the procedure and one in the morning before they go home. And the things that we're ruling out, we want to make sure there's patency. We want to make sure that there was a complication which we've had, like this brachial artery um, pseudoaneurysm is still basically gone, and the artery has a bigger lumen the next day. Um, we're looking for perfusion defects, and later on, we're looking for renal growth. That's very key to us. Is the kidney growing after all we've done? So ultrasound, we do it one month, then we'll do it at six months. And then if there's any question, we'll do a CTA. We have some research grants that we are trying to move along. This one, we are moving along, um, contrast ultrasound in pre and post angioplasty. And I will say to you, this one, and I'm going to move right on with that because I think it's very important. You can see here, for example, we use contrast ultrasound pre when we know what side the stenosis is on. And then afterwards, it's one of the ways like the radi wire that we say, okay, I think we're done. So we give another bolus of Lumison and we do it post and we look for perfusion defects and we look for perfusion of the kidney in general. And you can see these are time matched um, examples here, how patchy this kidney was that I showed you earlier in its perfusion 
and how postangioplasty is perfusing rapidly and the way you would expect it. And then when you do time intensity curves, you can see the improvement after in the time to cortical perfusion. And we can do all these funky things and we will publish all this series as well. We just want to get to a, a happy number. Um, but we are doing this pre and post and doing perfusion curves and seeing the result and seeing if we can sort of predict somehow the endpoints in the future and see if we can use it. You need an IV in, in for follow-up later on. So more to come on this, but just to let you know what we're doing. And here you can see we use it to follow up patchy areas that were wire spasm and hypoperfusion. And this patient was left on heparin overnight because when that's your final angio after doing a renal artery angioplasty of the mid renal, we want to keep them on. And this is an immediate post contrast ultrasound image, the gray scale and that, and you can see the perfusion defect very nicely here in the, in the right upper pole. So it's a beautiful type of technology for perfusion, as you probably know from tumors, et cetera, in terms of micro bubbles. And in this one, we were following wire spasm. So you can see here, there's a patchy area that we just, we knew on, on a orthography was wire spasm. And you're looking for that on the following day. And that's just after the procedure. And then when we look the following day, I'm sorry, am I going backwards here now? No, I'm not. When we look the following day, it's gone. So as I said here, other things that you will be getting with your new angio suites, which are much nicer than what we have now um, in our old technology, is single eye flow. So we've been using this for renal arteries and superimposing our images on a color composition, which is, again, time to peak perfusion. And just to highlight the usefulness of this here. So this is a 90% stenosis of this accessory, which we dilated with a two millimeter balloon. And you can see the time to perfusion relatively of this portion of the kidney is much longer than the remainder. And then when you do the same angiographic run with the catheter in the same place at the same rate of infusion, you can see how much improved that area is afterwards. So again, in the room, you can put this on after your last run and press single eye flow and put your little dots. In the newer systems, it's even better and get another sort of adjunctive measurement of improvement. And we've done this in many areas. We are trying to publish this paper. It's older stuff because we haven't got the new imaging system yet. But you can see that you can basically do pre and post evaluation. So I hope when you get your new suites here, you'll get interested in that for a lot of the vascular technology and, and take it to another level because they have it on the Siemens systems now. And it, it's called something else on the Philips systems. Other things we're looking at through the consortium is taking blood for various genetic abnormalities. We're not, and if we do have to biopsy the kidney, we'll also send it for genetics, but it's uncommon. So we're really hoping we get this out of the blood. And so far, we really don't have much information, as you can see here on FMD. If you have a syndrome, yes. If you have not a syndrome, we think it's probably in the SMAD pathway, which is not a small pathway. So, you know, can't tell you much more than that, but we're still looking for genetic links to FMD and its multiple ways for manifestation. So more to come on that, I hope, in the future. Standardizing imaging protocols are very important. We're all over the place. Our CT protocols are all over the place. Um, algorithms for angiographic referral, we're trying to tighten with nephrologists. And I would say if you have a high index for suspicion that this is not is essential hypertension, you go to angiography. It's as simple as that, even if the CT is negative. Um, <clears throat> Follow-up algorithms are different in lots of institutions. We have our own. Other places won't follow up for three months or six months. And we are looking at the contrast ultrasound outcomes. Again, we're one of the few people using contrast ultrasound to evaluate immediately after and in 24 hours. And again, hopefully we can make recommendations on that when we do enough patients. So take-home points. Renal FMD is not the same as adults. It's intimal and at best some medial fibroplasia, but it's not medial hyperplasia like 30 and 40 year old women. The best angiographic response and angioplasty response is in short lesions, less than one centimeter. Please consider angiography and angiography when the CT is negative and the patient doesn't fit the profile for essential hypertension. It's well worth it, even though it's anesthesia and it's arterial poking and all of that, it's well worth it. And it does put families' minds at ease if you can say the gold standard is negative. 
consider angioplasty even if you're on one medication. And I do believe that because angioplasty on one medication can be life-changing from medication point of view and for renal growth, because we don't know why the manifestations are not related to the type of artery that's stenosed, whether it's you know the first or the subsegmental level. So I think it's worth it. And we are doing it with one medication. And consider the cutting balloon for resistant stenosis. It's higher risk, but it can, when you know you're not affecting a change with a conventional balloon, it is really all that you have. Or refer to CHOP for the cutting balloon. We'd love to have them. Thank you. Thank you.